Currently in the United States, Yesu uh, has about 40% of the repeater market as far as all the repeaters out there that are amateur. Whether they're being used in System Fusion digital mode or not, we're currently the, the strongest uh, supporting infrastructure in the United States right now for amateur radio. So uh, we've come a long ways. Uh, we've sold several thousand of these repeaters across the United States. We keep selling more every day. So there's infrastructure out there to support uh, this new digital technology. Uh, just recently, we uh, released a um, Wires X, which is our wide area uh, internet networking system that uh, was just released uh, December 25th. And uh, we have a new version of the software that if you have a newer repeater, you can connect what we call a Wires HRI 200 to the repeater and we can now interconnect repeaters across the United States. Uh, one thing that's nice about Fusion, it doesn't require internet at the repeater site to create linking. Um, so as some of the other technologies such as DMR and DSTAR require, you can have a remote node connected to the repeater which will enable DSTAR access. So I'll talk about that, that more in a minute here. Uh, what I'm gonna start off with is a, is a quick product overview of what's available from Yesu. Uh, we have the uh, least expensive radios out on the market as far as digital goes right now. This is a developing technology. We wanted to provide it to uh, the community relatively low cost and uh, try to get the radios out there and uh, get people building uh, more, uh, more stuff for System Fusion. So we've already seen a few things uh, pop up in the Fusion world. One device is the DB4 Mini. Uh, Northwest Digital Radio has also come up with a device that allows you to use System Fusion and interconnect System Fusion and develop your own applications for uh, the System Fusion protocols. So, um, quick product overview. Uh, we have a few radios out on the market, some supporting infrastructure, the DR1X, which I talked about. We are selling these repeaters for $600, tax and shipping included, so it's a, it's a heck of a deal. For the first year and a half, we sold them for $500, and uh, that's how we got them out on the market. So uh, we've flooded the market with, uh, with repeaters. They're in every major city right now. You could find one with a digital mode enabled on it, a lot of wide area coverage repeaters. So if you do have a newer Yesu radio and it's digital, uh, chances are in the area somewhere you could find a System Fusion repeater. Uh, the first radio we came out with, the uh, first two radios were the FT1 uh, DR and the FTM 400 DR. We've since switched to the XD models, which have an enhanced GPS in them. They're a little bit more accurate and have a quicker time to fix. Um, our next release in the line was the FT991, which is an all-mode, all-band uh, HF and VHF, UHF radio that has 6 meter in it. It uh, has an integrated sound card in it. Uh, it has an integrated uh, auto tuner and a color touch screen. So it's a really nice radio. It's, it's a ham shack in the box. Um, the FTM100 and FT2DR were the next releases along with the HRI200. Uh, the HRI200 is our internet linking device that will plug into any analog or digital Yesu radio. Now the analog radios you can't run Wires X digital on, but it is backwards compatible in the analog network into some of our other radios such as an FT8800, 7800, and, and so forth. Any of the radios with the data jack in the back will work with the HRI200. So it comes with both cables for the newer radios, which are 10-pin, and the older radios, which are 6-pin. Uh, you can also interface it uh, to any other analog radio out there that you want. If you want to use a third-party analog radio, it is compatible with it. Um, FT2DR is a really unique uh, radio. I'll get into that in a minute. Um, it has a, a touch screen on it that can also display images. So uh, FT1 XDR, analog and digital, has APRS built into it. All of the uh, System Fusion radios do have a GPS module in them. Uh, if you're running APRS, you can also do telemetry over our digital mode, which is, uh, which is really nice. You get real-time telemetry in our digital narrow mode, which can transmit voice and data at the same time. We'll talk a little bit more about those capabilities in a minute. Uh, we do have an MH85 A11U camera microphone. You can take snapshots and send digital pictures to people using that microphone, a really nice accessory. And those images can be displayed out onto the FTM400 XDR's display as well as the FT2DR. Um, 400 DR is the world's first amateur color touchscreen radio. Uh, the radio on the front is touchscreen. It can be fully programmed from the touch screen. It does have a memory card slot where you can store and retrieve uh, memories from as well. Um, APRS and TNC is built into this radio as well. The only radio that does not have a TNC in it and APRS capabilities is the FT991. 
So all these radios, we're starting to just go ahead and put the, the APRS stuff in it. Uh, we're putting, because we have the GPS modules in there anyways for C4FM digital uh, to do telemetry. So might as well just put, them in, put the features in there. Um, 991, I call the shack in a box. Um, it's got everything in it you need, auto tuner, sound card. Uh, so if you have a signal link or a rig blaster, you don't need that anymore with this radio. You plug in one USB connection, you have a virtual serial port, and you have audio in, audio out going to the radio. One nice feature, it separates a rig blaster signal link uh, from this radio. A lot of people are running them on them. I tell them, you know, don't do that because you're actually cutting yourself a little bit short. Um, you can run true FSK, AFSK through this unit. So if you want to run 300 baud packet, it's really, really efficient for a 300 baud packet out of the box. It's 100 watts all mode, all band throughout the bands, uh, 50 watts on FM. Uh, 50 watts on UHF as well. If anybody here had the 897, you'd remember that you only had 35 watts coming out on the UHF side. So there's a few advantages to running the 991. Um, it does have a color touchscreen on it. Uh, one of the nice features I like about putting the touchscreens on these radios are we can't add and remove buttons to radios these days. So if you know you want to put another button on the front of a radio, it's a hardware change. With the touchscreen radios, we just have to do a firmware change and we can add features or move things around to, to make the radio easier to use or you know, add something new to the radio. So it opens up a world of possibilities. All these radios are firmware updatable. Um, the FT1, FT2, uh, 400 and so forth all come with the cables that you need to do those software upgrades. In some cases, those cables can also be used for programming. If you like the popular RT system software, you've already got the cable to program the radio. Um, 2DR is uh, the first high-resolution touchscreen amateur radio. A very unique radio, uh, hit the market really, really hard. Uh, people are in really enjoying the touchscreen and the direct input and the ease of programming on these radios. There's no more having to use the dial all the time to program the radio and <coughs> strange keys to hit and things like that. Everything's on, in plain English right on the front of the radio and it's very, very easy to navigate. <coughs> Um, this radio does have dual vocoders in it. Uh, one thing that you won't see on the FT1DR and the FTM400 is the ability to use digital on both VFOs. So this radio is the first in the line that allows you to do that. And I see Yesu as we go down the f in, in the future having digital on both sides of the radio. So that is a benefit to having the 2DR. Uh, the 100 is the latest radio we came out with. It's a single uh, VFO version of the FTM 400 with a smaller display. Uh, it still does have the GPS in it. Uh, you can't use our camera microphones with it. It's the only system fusion radio that you can't use the camera mic with, aside from the 991. Um, still has APRS built into it, still has a memory card slot for programming, and still can be programmed from the rear of the radio with the RT system software. So. Just a scaled down version, a couple hundred bucks less, it's a really good radio. Um, as I talked before about the repeater, uh, the DR1X is a 50 watt repeater. It's, uh, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, it is dual band, um, so it's VHF or UHF. It can cross band uh, unidirectionally, not bidirectionally. It can cross band from VHF to UHF or UHF to VHF. Um, I have a lot of people using them as links in between relay systems. They work really, really efficiently for that. Um, very easy to program. It has a touch screen on the radio. So a lot of people running these things in emergency communications vans or as portable repeaters can change frequencies right from the front display. There's no programming software necessary to, to program the repeater. Uh, from start to finish, it takes about 20 minutes on average. We've had reported back to us through our installation program. We get a lot of feedback back from everybody. It takes about 20 minutes to, to install the repeater, to rack mount it, swap it out with an older repeater, and, and have it on the air, programming and everything. So uh, it's very, very easy to sell these things, saying that you don't have to take any time, you don't have to learn any special software, buy any special programming software to put this repeater in. Everything's included right in the box, except the duplexers and antenna system. Um, the heart of the system is automatic mode select. I'll go into a little bit of detail about it. Uh, not only are these repeaters dual band and digital, but they're analog as well. They have the ability to swap in between analog and digital. Um, AMS also works on the client radios. That means whatever, radio, whatever your radio is receiving, that's the mode it's going to set to. If it's receiving digital, it's going to go into digital mode. If it's receiving analog, it's going to go into analog mode. 
Um, there are a few features on the radio that make it really easy to swap in between these modes, either with the press of a button or a couple clicks of the, uh, the mic key. You can switch in between modes. Um, you can set the radio to revert to the last mode it received and transmit on that mode, or you can have it revert back to the mode that you were currently running. So there are several different ways that we can set up AMS uh, to work with these radios. So the repeater will detect if it's analog and digital, and it'll transmit either analog or digital. But it also has the capability of translating digital into analog and analog into digital. So there's several different modes you can remotely set the repeater to, to have it actually translate in between the different modes. So if you do have a digital radio and there are analog people that want to come into a conversation, you can set the repeater to a fixed FM output and have it automatically receive and translate between A and D to the output. The, uh, the ability that is really strong is, is to use whichever system best suits your needs. Um, we have several different modes such as digital, narrow, voice, wide. I'll go into those in a minute. The repeater will automatically pick that up and translate whatever mode that you're in. We do have a digital data mode that's 9,600 bits per second. Um, with overhead, you're actually getting about 8,000 bits per second, roughly out of it on estimation. So we're a little bit faster than D-Star, where I believe, um, and in some slides here, I believe it's around 840 bits per second that you actually are able to use in digital mode. So it's a little bit quicker. Um, we're expanding on that system. Uh, our engineers are looking right now into connectivity to allow this digital data system to work with directly with your computer. So that's one thing that's being developed in Japan right now. We're not sure of a time frame of when this stuff's going to come out. And we've seen a lot of third-party stuff like the DV4 Mini that I've mentioned that allows some direct keying and some other stuff that people have been working on. So what, what I'm really looking forward to with Fusion are third-party applications that are going to be developed. Um, I want to see a lot more kind of pop up from the community. We've seen a lot of that in DSTAR, and uh, with Yesu and the Wires X network, Wires is going to kind of stay over to this side and be a Yesu product. So there's a lot of uh, potential that's, that's popping up in the market with, with third-party applications right now. And um, honestly, when it comes to infrastructure, Yesu wants to support that. Uh, we have several documents that are available to any developers. If anybody in this room wants to develop anything, let me know, I'll give you a card so that you know, I can get you some information and you can work with our engineers to further develop your products. So we've been very, very open about our protocol, our modulation, and how System Fusion works. We publish several documents that explain in, in technical detail how everything works. System Fusion was designed as an independent radio system. We had very little intentions of actually networking this product. When we put it out onto the market, we found out that people wanted to network it. This bottom line into story with uh, all the other technologies out there, that's one of the benefits of digital. Um, so as we've expanded, and here just recently, December 25th, we released the WiresX software, and all of our new repeaters are shipping with new firmware that allow you to connect WiresX directly to the unit. Any repeater that's out there now, as I mentioned, can use our new WiresX software we, re we released and use a remote node such as an FTM 100 or 400 to connect into the DR1X and enable connectivity through WiresX. Um, one other thing Yesu had in mind when developing these products is firmware upgradability and cost. We wanted to build a unit that was inexpensive. That's one reason we didn't go with uh, TDMA or some of the other solutions that are out there. It's because they're a little bit pricier. We were able to put better technology at a lower cost in these radios by going with C4FM and using FDMA instead of TDMA. Um, firmware upgradability throughout the life of these products. You can get firmware updates to enable new features, enhancements, uh, bug fixes, and so forth uh, are going to be freely available. So Yesu is not going to charge for any of those. It's not going to cost you any more money. Uh, another reason was resource management. Using FDMA and the high-speed data, we can actually push more features over this, uh, this network, more features over the radio. So. That's why we focused on that specific mode and we didn't go with some of the others. Uh, one other reason is if we were to go TDMA or do two, two time slot TDMA was one thing that was requested by a lot of people. The problem is when you're running two time slot TDMA, you have no analog. There's, this, there's no way to do it. Um, it's the way that everything runs when you have two time sources running like that. It's just not possible for us to swap in between analog and digital, especially when networked. So. We went ahead and did FDMA, um, and it's brought the cost down on these radios. Some of you can see these uh, FT1 DRs, the old version of, of this radio right here. They're running between 260 and 280 on the market right now. For a, 
for a radio that does um, digital APRS, has all the features that it has in it, it's an amazing price. <coughs> um, compared to other digital solutions, um, C4FM, 4-level FSK, and FDMA has a better bit error rate. Um, is anyone here familiar with what bit error rate is? All right. That's how much data we can lose before you start hearing the R2-D2 sound. <laughs> So uh, once our signal degrades so much, uh, or a certain amount, uh, and we usually see about 15 to 20 percent, we start getting what's called artifacting uh, in our audio transmission. And that's basically the vocoder's not able to get enough data into it to properly decode the voice audio. So with uh, C4FM and using the AMBI 3000 codec, we've seen a great improvement in these, uh, in these products over GMSK and some of the other methods out there. Uh, I'm not knocking TDMA, I'm not knocking P25 or anything. Our solution is pretty much phase one P25. If you want to know what System Fusion is and you want to know some details about it, um, APCO has a lot of resources at apcoapco25.org. Um, and you can look up Project 25 and look up the phase one specifications. Uh, we're just pretty much flopping a bit at the end of our transmission. Uh, one of the reasons for that uh, the FCC really doesn't want to see amateur radios go into the digital world, and I fully understand that. Uh, people can do a Mars modification to an analog radio, and older analog networks, we saw a lot of uh, Part 97 radios going on to the commercial bands. So the FCC wisened up, and we decided to work with them. They said, well, if you're going to develop an amateur technology, make an amateur, and, and that's what we did. It wasn't that we were trying to cut anybody off as far as compatibility or not let you use our commercial equipment on our network. It's, it's just a, a choice that keeps the commercial world happy with the amateurs and, and so forth. And it keeps our costs down and our liability down. And that's what this is all about, is, is providing a cost-effective radio to the amateur community. Uh, when we saw some of the other amateur digital technologies pop up, um, and especially getting into uh, first starting with Moto Turbo, when I first started with it, we were buying five and $600 radios. They were incredibly expensive. I think my XPR 6550, when it first came out, was like $800. I was working for a Motorola dealer, and that was with my discount. So, um, you know, keeping the cost down is what we're trying to do and get the stuff out there onto the market. A um, couple of comparisons with, uh, with D-Star. Uh, bit rates, 9,600 bits per second in our digital narrow mode with 3,600 bits per second of uh, forward error correction. We see 4,800 bits per second with D-Star, about 1,200 bits per second with forward error correction. That's why you're not hearing as much voice response in D-Star. The more data that you have, the more data that you can push over the transmission, the better it's going to make for a sound. Um, we're using a little bit newer vocoder, which allows us to do more. Um, in the future, if we did decide to uh, do something TDMA, if we decided to maybe go into the Phase 2 P25 world, uh, we can do that with the current vocoder we have. That means it's just a software update to your current radios that you purchase. You're not going to have to go out and buy new hardware if we decide to expand. So there's future expansion capabilities with this product through software updates. Um, during your warranty period, Yaesu 100% supports any firmware updates you do. I have not heard of anyone bricking a radio yet running a firmware update. So the, the process that we have for actually performing the firmware update is pretty, pretty solid and, and, and works very well. Um, our radios, all of our radios do have a built-in GPS except the FT991. And most of the System Fusion radios that are going to pop out are going to have the uh, built-in GPS with them. Uh, we do have APRS capabilities in all the radios. Um, the 991 is lacking some of this stuff right now. It does do digital telemetry through an external GPS, but we don't have the APRS software built yet for the 991. That might be a future uh, firmware update that Yaesu is going to offer. Uh, no additional accessories or boards to buy. Any Fusion radios ready to go out of the box is going to support every, uh, every feature that we have on our Wires X network as well as connecting to other radios point to point. Uh, we do consume a little bit more bandwidth than D-Star is, about 6.5 kilohertz. Um, on, a, on a service monitor, I actually see about 10. The advertised is 6.25. I see about 10 kilohertz out of it. Uh, System Fusion can either operate 20 kilohertz or 12.5, so we have narrow and wide FM capabilities. Uh, a lot of areas and a lot of repeater coordinators in the United States are, uh, 
requiring that you run narrow band now if you're running digital. So we did put that feature in there in the latest firmware update. Um, usable data speed in our uh, data only mode. After forward error correction, we have 4,800 bits per second as opposed to DSTAR's 950. And actually, I thought it was 850. It's 950 bits per second. Um, so digital data transfer is a little bit faster. Uh, it's about 15 seconds for a uh, VGA image that was our, ca our cameras take, which is 340 by 480. Um, you can transmit a very nice image. Uh, we are using four-level FSK instead of GMSK. And the reason we're doing that is just entirely because of uh, data rates. Uh, we can fit two bits in the same spot where DSTAR can fit one bit, so we're getting over twice the uh, throughput in our transmissions. Um, Internet's not required at a tower site to link. Um, we do have the built-in cameras and the MH85s. Um, texting via keypad, I know some of the D-Star radios, this might be wrong, I know some of the D-Star radios have some type of capability to do that and you can connect them through a, a phone now and stuff. So in all honest comparison, um, both technologies do have some type of direct input, but we do have it straight from the face of the radio. Um, we do have touchscreen radios. That's one thing I keep pushing is firmware updates and touchscreen means more features. And the full color LCD on the FTM 400 and FT 991. So I, I do see this is going to be something that our competitors are going to start picking up on. So I think that Yesu is starting to put all these nifty color uh, LCDs in the radios. And the cost of those LCDs and those modules has dropped. I see the other manufacturers probably in the future starting to do that. So hopefully we get a little bit of spin off from that because as much as I love amateur radio, I want to see more of this technology pop in. Um, there are four different modes these radios can operate in. Uh, we have a voice data mode, which is known as digital narrow, which allows you to uh, transmit telemetry and images along with voice. Uh, we have a full rate voice mode, which increases the voice response um, considerably, which is called our voice wide mode. Uh, we do have a full rate data mode, which is 9600 bits per second, and of course our conventional analog FM mode. And these can all be ran either narrow or wideband. A um, few features I'm going to go through real quick. Uh, we have a digital group monitor mode. Uh, group monitor allows you to connect in digital narrow mode and transmit voice, text, and telemetry. You join a group, you can get RSSI, which you see down here at the bottom. Um, so you can actually see how far before a station is going to run out of signal. Um, we have digital image, image transmission, which is our full rate data mode. Also for texting, we use full rate data mode. Uh, we have a smart navigation function, which I really like. This can be used in group, in or out of group mode. If someone's transmitting to you, they have their GPS turned on, you're receiving telemetry information, you can store their location in the radio. Um, all of our radios will give you a compass that will provide you with a heading of where that station last transmitted. So for emergency operations, this is a really, really nice feature. Um, we have a backtrack function where you can also store your own location, such as a command post, and actually navigate back to that, uh, that location. And um, really quickly, I'll go through the HRI 200 uh, internet linking and wires. Everybody is interested in this. Um, this is what we consider our advanced voice over IP wireless network. Uh, which is currently advancing. It does allow analog and digital over the network. It will translate between analog and digital, so it will convert A to D and D to A. Um, it's very low bandwidth consumption, actually, compared to some of the other technologies out there. Uh, we do have rooms, which are, called, which are similar to D-Star reflectors. They're the same thing. So there are reflectors out there. A lot of people have uh, said to me recently that you know, wires doesn't have reflectors. Well, yes, we do. <laughs> Uh, we have a new station function, which allows you to store images, text messages, and digital data and retrieve it directly from the radio. And, of course, we have smart search, smart access. You do not need to connect your Yesu radio to the Internet or run any firmware updates in order to see who's on the network, see which repeaters are connected. To connect to another room, another node, everything's done in real time over RF. So no updating of firmware or anything like that to get databases into radios. Um, just want to mention once again, we do have a full suite of APRS features in this radio, which are fully compliant with the 1.2 standards. Uh, we're working on some stuff right now to bring that up a, a little bit. So the APRS system is being looked into by Yesu right now, and we're going to 
probably have some future expansion on that, of course, which will be a firmware update. Uh, we have a web portal if you want more information is at systemfusion.yesu.com. There's a wealth of information on there. We have an FAQ section, a knowledge base, support forms. Um, if you want to know more about System Fusion, you can connect here. You can also connect uh, centrally to all of our social networking through this website. Uh, so there's a lot on there, and um, if you have a question you want to ask, you can go there after the presentation. At, uh, to finish up here, I know we're running pretty short. Does anyone have any questions about System Fusion or any of the ASU products that I can answer today? Uh, yes, sir. How about the WireX system? How is that going to work now? Hooking it into your repeater and connecting it with another repeater? Um, well, all, all you need to do is you have to have a PC at the site, so you hook up the PC and the HRI 200 to the back of the repeater, and you'll have an interface where you can connect to any other node or room on a Windows machine. Now, you can also use your radio to control the wires X node. So you can search for other nodes and station and connect to other nodes and stations from your radio itself. So there are several different ways to enable connectivity between the wires X network and your client radio. Do you actually need a computer hooked up to each, each one of the wires X? Um, each one of the nodes, yeah. So if you have a repeater or if you have a remote <coughs> node that's connected to a repeater, you'd have to have a PC hooked up to that at, at this time. So directly wires X, directly to the internet. Right, that's, that's correct. Yeah, it's not a direct connection. It does require some type of a PC. Yeah, but there's a ton of, like, mini ITX boxes out there. Yeah, mini ITX. Uh, what, what I use, and it's a good 12-volt solution, are those little thin clients. Uh, that I mean, they're, they're a dime a dozen, and you can pick up, like, a 1.6 gig with two, or th two to four gigs of RAM, two to four gigs of flash for, like, 15 bucks off eBay. And a little 12-volt machine. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, Chris, I do have a question. Just went to that point. There are also plenty of 12-volt ATX power supply modules that you can plug into that PC. So you oh, don't yeah. have to have, you don't have to worry about, you know, how you're going to run that little PC. You put an SDD, SSD on it and you're done. Yeah, and most of them have everything you need in them. If you buy them used off eBay, they're about 15 bucks. You can get them brand new for about 100 You know, they have these, you can find them brand new in the box. Yeah, so. SSD, yeah the, the, the mini ATX, I mean, the ATX power supply is around 12 volts. Yeah, all those things are, yeah, they're, cheap. They're yeah. Stuff. yeah. Um, you alluded in kind of different ways to the, 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 the upgrading the PC functionality. You kind of mentioned earlier, then you mentioned it in the context of, um, of the APRS functionality which is essentially one way it comes to right. out, physical back in. So if I have my Windows tablet or my end, heaven forbid, Android tablet, um, you know, uh, please don't know what I like that. Um, anyway, um, I'd like to be able to use that touch screen to be able to enter messages and things like that. I'd like to be able to pretty much drive a lot of that PC-oriented functionality from a touch screen tablet. And so in general, and also, by the way, the video, the, or the picture conversion, mm -hmm. or even sending my own media, you know, among friends, the, just facilitating that. You know, the, the third party stuff will follow if you facilitate that access, that communication. So I got to really kind of push on you, like, talk to the folks in Nippon that to get it done. Oh, I, yeah, I, f I fully agree. And our uh, engineering department in Tokyo, I've been conversing with them a lot about those features. That's, that's one of the main things I push with them. I said, we, we got to have that. We kind of have to have it. You already thrown in the one-way stuff. And uh, what I've gathered right now is it, is it might be a hardware limitation in the radios at the moment. So it might be a future product that supports that. But I'm really hoping they can just do something with the firmware and enable two-way communication. So they haven't gotten back to me yet and defined this is what's going to happen, this is what we need, or what we're going to have to do. But I'd say about once a week they get pushed. So. You know, and that's that's saying a lot if you've ever worked with Japanese engineering. It's uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 God bless us. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, does the computer require Windows? Could it be a Linux-based computer? It requires Windows. I do have some people running it on Linux through Wine right now. Some are running it through VirtualBox. So I've seen a couple of different ways to run it. Um, there's Not there's a suggestion ultimately if there's Linux support then that makes a Raspberry Pi possible. It does, so yeah, that and that's true. that's something that we brought up to them and. I, I'm not sure that the resources are in place right now for them to develop Linux software, but they definitely know about it. They definitely know it's in demand. So we get a lot of a lot of demands for that. One of the things I tell people to do is back on this ASU uh, System Fusion web portal. It's jump on there and submit a uh, FAQ request or submit a contact request and request that.
They don't, they don't like hearing that. They think I'm pushing them at that point. Yeah, uh, what's that? We're hoping. We're hoping for you know a lot more connectivity through third-party devices. But once there's PC connectivity, and what Yesu has always done in the past is anytime we put out, put out a radio with PC connectivity, whether it's accessing the the TNC directly, like the FTM350, we'll put a, we'll send a cat manual, or you know we'll publish a manual with it on how to control it. I don't see them making anything proprietary when it comes to PC connectivity, and that's that's where System Fusion is really going to open up. As soon as they get that down and get that hammered down. That's going to be good. I've got some communication back from Tokyo Engineering that was kind of like hush hush. <laughs> they didn't want to tell me anything. When they don't want to tell me something, that means they're getting ready to do something. Right. So yeah, yeah. They don't they don't want the sneaky salesman going out trying to sell more radios. So you know that's. <laughs> Oh, I fully agree. I fully agree. Yeah, that's that's what I want to see is third-party development. Yeah, that's that's what we're pushing, and we, we know that uh, we've seen it in DSTAR when the DVAP came out, and um, I've had uh, VPs at ICOM tell me, I, you know, I asked them, I said, when the DVAP came out, were you worried you weren't going to sell more DSTAR repeaters? He said, no, I'm glad I'm going to sell more DSTAR radios. You know, if you sell one D-Star radio with every DVAP that's sold, that's a huge success because we look at how many DVAPs have been sold. So that's that's what I look at as well. Um, yes, sir? Do you foresee uh, Bluetooth integration in the future for things like keyboards? Um, you know, that was actually brought up to me by the engineering department about a year and a half ago. I know that they're looking into that because they, they know the Bluetooth's there, and since, you know, Bluetooth 2.0 and some of the other stuff's popped up that we've put into our radios, they understand there's more potential. So they've, they've seen that potential and hopefully they act on it. But what I like to do is I like to push them with one, one group of things at a time. If they come out with PC connectivity first, I'm not going to complain about Bluetooth for a while. <laughs> I'm just going to let them catch up and make sure that they, they develop a good product that's, that's solid and stable. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, what's going on with the, uh, the power on the, on the repeaters? Now? I've been told to not run it over 20 watts. Um, it depends on how much operation you're getting. Um, we've seen people that, that typically have three or four hours of continuous duty. We, we recommend they don't run it on full power just because the repeaters aren't recovering fast enough to cool themselves. Uh, the repeater's amateur duty is what they first came out and called it. And what happens is, is the PA in the repeater actually sets its power back depending on heat. Um, that probably should have been done off some type of duty cycle formula rather than heat. Uh, because it doesn't catch up enough. By the time it gets so hot and, and it's recycling itself and it's getting, you know, it just doesn't work right. So what? Don't shut up. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they don't. But we had to come back and say, okay, we need to we need to firmly put a duty cycle on these just to make sure people are a little bit more aware. Uh, most people run them at full power and don't have any problems. You know, it seems to to do pretty well for them. So we've adjusted some uh, timer settings as far as the fans go, and we're doing a little bit more cooling. If if you've if you've seen the first generation, some clubs have bought a first generation repeater that have one of the new ones that just came out. There's a little bit of airflow change, how everything works in there. They've changed the way the fans work. They're continuous duty now. They're not, you know, they're on all the time. They're not running based off of thermosistors. So it's a little bit different. Um, until further notice. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's 600. It's 600 now, yeah. So it went up from five to six hundred, and that's just to help cover some of the cost of development for Wires X. The company is losing quite a bit of money on these repeaters. I'm told I only have about two minutes left, so we do have an FT1 XDR we're giving away, and this is the latest radio. This has a 2.2 amp hour battery in it, new GPS module. Everyone got theirs filled out? Get one more here. Not one more. All right. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, okay. Do you have any questions?